Oh my goodness, that's so much fun. And, and they get away with that when they're younger. Don't say that when you're older. Happy Mother's Day to all of you moms and those of all of us have a mother and we can celebrate and appreciate that today. And I would say to my mom if she's watching online, Happy Mother's Day to my mom. And I'm sorry for everything I did to hurt you. You know, you, all of us have that too, correct? We've done things to mess with our mothers. First Lady Laura Bush tells the story of when she and her husband, President at the time, George Bush, went to visit their, her, his mom and dad in Texas. Those of you that know history know that uh, his dad was also a president. So George Bush gets up one morning, 6 a.m. like normal, goes downstairs, grabs a cup of coffee out of the kitchen, goes in to the living area, and there is mom and dad already sitting there, and he sits down with his cup of coffee and puts his feet up on the sofa table in front of the sofa, to which his mother... Barbara Bush said, son, get your feet off that table. And his dad says, honey, he's the president of the United States. You can't talk to him like that. To which she said, I don't care who he is. He's still my son and I'm his mother. Get your feet off the table. Isn't it true? Your mom doesn't care where you came from, what you did, what you've accomplished in life. Don't mess with mom. Do what mom tells you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Not that there's a mother in this text, even though it's there, but we don't see her name listed. But we're going to talk about Samuel. We're in a series. We started it last week. If you missed last week, you can go back and watch it online. It's called What God Notices. And what you see out of the story of Samuel's life is the things that we think God notices are not those things at all. We, we talked about this last week with Hannah. She was crying out to God for a baby boy. She begged God for a baby boy. And the prayers and the recitation and all the practices and sacrifices didn't really accomplish what she wanted. But when she gave God her heart cry, God took notice. Today we're going to see what God wants to notice in you and me as his children. And it's exactly what we're going to see out of the story between Eli and his sons and the son of Hannah named Samuel. It's in 1 Samuel 3. Let me give you the backdrop of this. God is going to pay attention to the, to the things that are going on in the household of Eli. Now, Eli has become, in a sense, the godfather. This is where we get the idea. In a sense, the godfather of Samuel. Hannah dedicated him to the Lord, put him under the house of Eli. He is now going to be a son in the household of Samuel, serving as one of the priests of that family. But he's got two much older brothers. Samuel's probably 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. And the two older brothers of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are probably in their teenage years, if not older than that. And just to give you a backdrop in chapter 2, before we get into chapter 3 today, I want you to see what Eli's sons are doing. They're supposed to be priests for the nation. In fact, this is how this worked. In the Old Testament, the priesthood was all based on lineage. Your name and your father and your lineage would carry on from generation to generation. They would pass on the priesthood to the next generation. So they're supposed to be responsible for sharing the prayers of the people to God. What a holy duty. But instead, they're not following Eli's example. They're goofing off. They're breaking the laws of God. They're carousing with the women at the city gate. They're robbing the people of their sacrifices for their own selfish appetites. They're stealing the offerings and using it to make money for themselves. They are called in 1 Samuel 2, scoundrels. And Eli goes to them and says, you guys got to cut it out. Like any good parent, you're messing with God. What are you doing? Stop it. And they wouldn't listen to Eli. And that's where we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 3, what God notices in his children. It's not your heritage, it's not your lineage, it's not your parents' accolades, it's not even your position, it's not your power, like George Bush learned. It has nothing to do with the position you hold. It has everything to do with your present obedience. God notices your obedience as his children. 1 Samuel 3 starts this way. Read it along with me. The boy Samuel, 8, 9, 10 years old, ministered before the Lord under Eli. 
And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Now we're going to pause right there. I just want you to see what's going to happen here is God's going to have an experience with Samuel. In a few minutes, Samuel's going to encounter the Lord in a way he's never experienced him before. He's going to speak to Samuel. But to do that, you notice, first of all, God takes notice of Samuel because he's doing what he should be doing for the Lord. He's prepared to hear from God. He's prepared to listen for the voice of God because of where he's placed himself. And I just think this is a great thing to look at today on Mother's Day. Because he's in the house of God ministering and serving in the temple when the two brothers that should be are out carousing and doing things wrong. Samuel chose to put himself in a place where he could hear God speak when the other two are rejecting God's voice. (laughs) Moms, get this. Hannah is the one that placed him there. Hannah's the one that made sure he was going to get an experience before the Lord. Hannah's the one that said, I'm going to dedicate my, my son to the Lord, and so that he can have a relationship with the God of the universe. Hannah's the one that should get credit for what Samuel's going to experience in just a minute. And I just want to speak to all of you moms that are here. Praise God that many of you are like my mom, and when it comes to her house, you're going to be before the Lord. My mom would not put up with me thinking I can just skip church anytime I want. She was going to make sure I was standing before God. Anybody's got a mom like that around? I love that about my mom now. And I want to encourage all of you that are mothers that are trying really hard and desperately in a world where you're outnumbered and the voices are telling your friends and your family are telling you, you don't need God, you don't need church, you can do it on your own. I got good news for you. You're doing the right thing when you put your kids in an environment where they can hear the Lord. Years ago, it says here, the word was rare. How sad, by the way. Eli's the priest of God. He serves two functions, prophet to speak for God to the people and priest to bear up the needs of the people to God. And he's not even hearing from God? How tragic. Why? I think this story is showing he wasn't prepared to listen. He was already going to ignore God just like his sons were. And the word of the Lord was rare. Many years ago, before iPhones had these wonderful apps that tell you directions and maps and waves and all that stuff, they had this other device. Now, I grew up in the era, and this is how old I am. I grew up in the era where you actually got a map. Now, don't confess this because you're all young. But there was a day where you actually used a map, a physical map, to find your way around towns. Anybody know about that? Do you remember that in history books? And then this other device came along, and my daughter bought me one of these devices for the car. We don't see them anymore. It's called a GPS. You guys know what they are? Oh, good, you do. I'm glad you know you've read your history. Uh, They are the devices you would just program in an address and it would tell you where to go. And when I first got it, I thought, this is fabulous. You know, this lovely sounding woman gets on and please take a right at the next exit and then go down the street, three blah. And it, it was great for the first two weeks. And then I got irritated. I don't want no stinking woman telling me where to go. That's how I felt. And worse than that, and this is what happened, really, I realized that the person on that or the programming would always send me a specific path to someplace, and I knew better. I knew how to get there a shorter way. I knew the shortcuts around town. I knew how to cut through certain areas, neighborhoods, and so forth. So I just took the thing and put it in in the glove box, said, I'm not using that thing until I need it. Well, about two weeks later, I knew how to get to some address that I was dropping off cookies, and I went a certain route across Tracy, and lo and behold, because I didn't have the device, there was a roadblock. And I had to stop and wait for half an hour to get through the roadblock. If I would have had the GPS on, it would have directed me 
a different way. Friends, listen carefully. In a world that tells you, you know how to do it, or they can tell you how to do it, we need to turn on God's GPS and prepare to hear what it tells us. And if you're watching online, I know how hard that is. Sit in your environment at home, all the distractions around you. You can do laundry, you can do all kinds of stuff while you're watching the service. I got news for you. You need to be preparing for God to speak to you when you tune in to a broadcast or listen to a service. And for all of you in here, I get it. There are tons of distractions around you. But you come to church prepared to hear the voice of God. And he will speak to you. Story goes on. One night, Eli... The priest, whose eyes were becoming so weak he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God, that's the candle that they would leave lit in the tabernacle, had not gone out yet. So Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord. He's waiting for the candle to get down so he can put a new one in and light it, and then he'll go to sleep and take care of things. He's lying in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And then he ran to Eli and said, you, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, you can hear this kind of out of a parent voice. I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Come on, any parent ever said that to your kid? So he went and lay back down. Again, the Lord called, and I can't say this in the way God would, but Samuel. And Samuel got up and ran to Eli again. He said, here I am, you called me. My son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And now Samuel, see Samuel's young kid, he's never heard the voice of God in his heart. He's never experienced God's voice speaking to him. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're still there. He didn't know the Lord yet. And the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him yet, like I hope to do today to you. And a third time, the Lord called, Samuel! And Samuel got up and he ran into Eli again. You got to appreciate his perseverance. Here I am, you called me. And then Eli realized, okay, I get what's going on. That's the Lord calling the boy. He's in with the ark. He's waiting on the candle. He's, He's where the presence of God is supposed to reside. I get it now. That's the Lord calling this boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say this, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went in and laid down his place. And the Lord came and stood there calling again as another time, Samuel, Samuel. That's terrible. That sounded like Charlton Heston on Ten Commandments. (laughs) Then Samuel said, here it is. Speak. Your servant is listening. And God did. The Lord said to Samuel, again, remember, this is a 10-year-old kid. He's a young kid. See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears, I find that interesting, ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. No, they haven't heard the word of the Lord, have they? They haven't, the word of the Lord was rare. They haven't even been listening for God. They aren't interested in what God says. They're doing that which was right in their own eyes. And yet, here's what God says. At that time, I will carry out against Eli, everything I spoke against his family through the prophet, read chapter two, from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons were blaspheming God by their behavior and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, here it is, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. You can't get out of this now. I'm changing the priesthood is what God is telling him. And he tells it to a 10-year-old kid. Now think about this. If God showed up when you were a kid and spoke to you that level of a message, how would you feel? Would you react to it? Would you respond to it? Would you ignore it? We say, oh, that's bad pizza last night. Or would you learn how to discern his voice? See, for all of us, God does speak to us. He is talking to us. 
But we have to learn what his voice sounds like. And that's exactly what Samuel learns from this experience. This was trial and error. He messed it up. He thought it was Eli three, four, three times there. And finally realizes, no, that's not Eli. That's the voice of God talking to me. He's trying to tell me something. I noticed three things about the conditions going on there that helped Samuel figure out it was God's voice. Number one, I noticed how the environment mattered. We talked about this before. If you want to hear from the voice of God speaking in your life, you got to put yourself in environments where he talks. You, You got to set yourself up for you to hear him speaking to you. And yes, that does include church. And yes, that does include your devotions. And yes, that does include situations, places of worship, other places where you can hear God directly. You know what it doesn't include? It doesn't include places where you are being taught to sin. It doesn't include situations where you're hearing his voice drowned out by the noise of the world. It doesn't include things where it tells you how the world wants you to be instead of listening to the whisper of God tell you who he wants you to be. You got to put yourself into an environment to learn his voice. Second thing, you got to have a relationship with him. And I could spend all day on just this one thought. This, This just blows my mind. I've been enjoying it all week long. He called him by name, Samuel. The God of the universe knew his name. And not only that, he didn't speak it in some crazy language that Samuel wasn't aware of. He talked to Samuel in a language that Samuel understood. Don't miss that. The God of the universe will speak to you and to me in the language that you know so that you can get the message he wants to give you. When he speaks to you, He will do it in a way you can understand. And then third, you've got to be willing. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. If you want to learn his voice, you've got to be willing to serve his word. Lord, that Lord word there is capitals, all caps. If you don't know this about the Old Testament, when you see L-O-R-D, all caps, that word there in Jewish writing is the word Yahweh. It's the word that God says about himself. It's the name he reveals to Moses. I am the I am. I am sovereign. I am almighty. I am God of the universe. And when Samuel, as a 10-year-old, says it, he's saying, you're the I am. I'm just your servant. Speak, and I'll listen. You got to tune into his voice. I was reading a guy who teaches this to churches, a book that he wrote, Stephen Machati. Stephen describes learning the voice of God like learning an instrument in an orchestra. Here's what he does he'll take students and kids from high schools, and he'll bring them to an orchestra concert, just like we had with the community concert a week or so ago. He'll bring them and he'll say, I want you to listen to the flutes. And these kids will like, what? I don't know how to discern the sound of a flute in the midst of an orchestra concert. So then he takes them away, get this, takes them away, teaches them what a flute sounds like first, and then takes them to the concert, and they can pick out the sound of the flute. God speaks to you in the exact same way. Listen carefully. If you don't write anything else down, this may be the thing you want to write down. God speaks to you in four ways. You've got to learn it privately so you can hear it in every other setting of your life. Four ways he speaks to you. Number one, through his word. You can't know the voice of God unless you're in his word. That's how you learn it. Secondly, he speaks through prayer. I'll get to that at the end of the message and explain to you how that works. Third, he speaks to you through your conscience. When you give your life to Jesus, just like Danny and Hannah just did, God intercedes into your conscience. He gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It comes into your soul, and now it speaks to your 
spirit about what you should, what you shouldn't do, how you should act, how you should respond. What's the right way to deal with the situation? Which way should I go? He starts intervening from the inside out. The more you tune into your conscience, the more you're tuning in to the voice of God. And then finally, he speaks through the body of believers, which kind of makes sense because if he's the head and we're the body of Christ, then of course, all of the body parts, much like our physical bodies, the nerves talk to each other so that the body can function. And the same is true when the body of Christ speaks to each other. Word, prayer, conscience, body. He's speaking to you and I. We got to learn his voice. Friends, you can't learn his voice without practice. You can't learn his voice without willingness. You can't learn his voice without relationship. And today may be the day you can learn his voice. My mom, God bless her. I got time today so I can tell you a story. My mom would go on a baseball field with us. She'd take us boys to play baseball. I'd go play baseball as a kid. She'd be sitting in the stands everybody yelling for their kids in the stands. You know whose voice I could hear? My mom, I, God bless her, she, she would, I'd be making a baseball play or something would be happening on the field and I'd hear from the stands, All I'm in left field, she's all the way over there. I'd hear from the, oi! <laughs> you know your mom's voice. Come on. You know your mom's voice. God wants you to know his the same way. But you got to be in the word. You got to have conversations with him in prayer. You got to listen to his talking to your conscience. And you have to be a part of the body to learn the voice of God. Samuel was. The other two brothers were not. Look what happens in the end. And I don't know that I could do what Samuel did here. He went back and laid down until morning. I don't think I would have slept. I mean, what a message. And then he goes and he opens the doors. This is a normal practice for the priests to do. They would open the doorways to the tabernacle area so that people, worshipers, could come in and make their sacrifices. He does that like his normal duty. And then... He hears from Eli. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son, <laughs> this is my interjection, get over here. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you? And then he just confirms, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely. If you hide from me anything he told you. Now just pause right there for a second. Let me just say this. This is so crucial for Samuel to become the prophet he will be. He's a 10-year-old kid. He's been given a message from the Lord. It's a convicting, difficult, harsh message to Eli. But Samuel, you've got to be willing to share it. I don't care if they don't like it. I don't care how they react. It doesn't matter what they think. You have this message from the Lord. You need to tell people that message. And just pull aside for a second. You have been given the greatest message of all time in the resurrection of Jesus. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You got to tell people. Oh, come on. That was a great amen. Wow. Round of applause. Here we go. Listen, Eli says, you got to tell me the truth. So Samuel told him everything. Like a good son would do. He hid nothing from him. And then Eli said, and this is a whole nother message for another time. He is the Lord. Let him do what's good in his eyes. Do you notice, by the way, just... This is in the Old Testament all over the place. No repentance. No turning back, no apology, no, I got to sacrifice to God. Oh, God, forgive me for what I've done to my sons. Let God do what he's going to do. And then notice the rest of the story. 
the Lord was with Samuel. They, they developed a relationship here as he grew up, and he let none of Saul from God's words fall to the ground. Samuel, anything Samuel said, God did. Anything God said, Samuel obeyed. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, north to south, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel. Remember the word of the Lord was rare? He revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Why? Because Samuel clinged to the word of God. In a world that wants to distract you and make you run and and make sounds and things around you to keep you from hearing the voice of God, Samuel tuned into it and obeyed it. He didn't let a single word of God's commands fall to the ground. Can we just be really honest for a second? My guess is, if you're like me, there's a lot of noise in your life that's trying to distract you from obeying the voice of God. It's loud. It's prevalent. And where God whispers to you in the deep depths parts of your spirit, those voices keep shouting at you from the outside what you need to do, what you shouldn't do, how you should behave, what you should be doing. And let's face it, our world is full of those voices. But you need to tune in to God's voice and cling to his every word. We need to reject the immorality of the world and cling to the purity of We need to quit making us be Lord of our life and start making him the Lord of our life. We need to do what he tells us to do, whether that's serving or giving or reaching a person or loving somebody. We need to be courageous enough to act on what he tells us to do through his word, through our prayers, and trust it. And oh, by the way, moms, we need to do what Hannah did and put our kids into a place where they can hear the word of God and cling to it. Because you know what? You may just have a Samuel in your home right now who needs the word of God to direct them into great purpose. But it starts with teaching them and you preparing to hear learning his voice, and then holding on to his word. You want to be good children? Listen to your mother. No amen on that one either, huh? You want to be good children of God? Start listening and obeying your Lord. I had my first experience with this when I was an adult. Really didn't understand prayer, nor really understand how to read God's word until a conversation that I had with God in a prayer in a car ride home from work one day. Diane and I were serving, supporting a youth ministry, helping helping our youth pastor with the ministry he was leading. We had high schoolers that we were supporting and serving in that ministry. And we had a number of high schoolers coming and we had a new high school as part of the Christian school that our church had established. And I was just praying to God on the way home one day. It was a tough season. It was difficult. I just said, God, how do we reach more students? How do we reach more high schools? Why can't we get them to come to church? What is it we're going to need to do in order to attract them and help them meet Jesus? God, tell me what to do about this. Tell me what to do about that. And I just basically was praying in command. Have you ever done that? Like, Pray, fix this. Pray, do something here. Pray, God, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I need from you. Show me a sign. Give me a direction. But I really wasn't asking. And then I changed my prayer for whatever reason. I said, I don't know what to do, God. Can you give me a hint? And right in the midst of this, this is on a car ride home. Right in the midst of that, I had this experience. Like It feels like yesterday. Scott? 
you're not even doing anything with the ones I already sent you. Ouch. Now, I, I, you know how you do this? Oh, that was, wow. Where did I come up with that idea? That was bad pizza last night, I'm sure of it. But I got home after that car ride, and for whatever reason, I pulled out my journal that night before I went to sleep, and I, I wrote that statement down. And I didn't sleep much that night. I just remember thinking about that statement. Where did that come from? Well, I mean, I didn't come up with that on my own. That wasn't even in my thinking when I was praying the prayers. But something inside me challenged me to do it differently. And I did. And then I realized, wait a second. If that's the voice of God, I've had those moments a lot. I just didn't know it was his voice. So then I started using my journal to write those thoughts down. And lo and behold, business ideas started coming to me. Answers to challenges in my life started appearing in my notes. Things that I had ignored before as just bad thinking on my part, or I'm just not paying attention to it, all of a sudden became real to me. And I suggest to you today, maybe God speaks to you the same. Maybe that impression inside you, that thought in your head, that instinct that keeps gnawing at you, but you keep ignoring it, could be the voice of God trying to direct you with an answer that you just need to prepare to listen to and learn it and then cling to his word. So here's my challenge to you this week. I want you to get a journal. I want you to write down questions, thoughts, problems, challenges, crises, difficulties in your life. And I want you to turn and ask God questions. And then whatever comes in your head, don't act on it right away. Whatever comes in your head, whatever comes back to your spirit, whatever you hear from other people, whatever you notice in people's lives around you, whatever shows up in your prayer life or shows up in your word, just write it down. And watch. You may just hear the voice of God. That's what happened to Samuel. It could happen to you too. And who knows? Maybe something will happen in your life just as amazing as what's going to happen in Samuel's. Some of you have already heard that voice because you know the Lord has been calling you to come surrender your life to him maybe for years. And you keep resisting. And you're missing out the greatest thing God will ever do in your life. He's waiting for you to cling to his word. Jesus, I just pray for people today, for all of us here, that this week would be life-changing. That much like you did in Samuel's life, in Saul's life, in David's life, many others, you would do in our life as well. You're speaking to us. Help us to tune into your voice. Make us willing. Put us in the right environment. And help us to take action on what you tell us to do. I pray that you would do something miraculous in every person's life this week. And much like we saw earlier today, many would come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior and discover a relationship with you like you had with Samuel. Thank you for our moms and for what they've done to put us in those moments. And I pray today you'll help us do the same for every generation following. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said,